Now, it, you know, there's there's a lot of questions uh, on this because could you know, the court ruled last month that the previous wording of that section in the criminal code was unconstitutional because it eliminated self-induced intoxication as a defense. How did you fix that? Well, we, we took cues from the court itself. The court gave us a couple of avenues, potential avenues to follow. Uh, we took those cues and we have, we have, what we have done is we have said that if it, it was reasonably uh, foreseeable, if the risk was reasonably foreseeable, that one would lose control in a state of, of, of uh, automatism, uh, then the entry into that state is what, we, is what we're criminalizing. So it's actually uh, the, the reasonable care that one takes or the, or the reasonable risk uh, that one ought to have seen uh, in entering into that state, either through drugs or alcohol or both. Um, it still maintains a defense for the for someone, for example, who is following a prescription and has a, a completely unforeseen reaction uh, to a medication and enters into that state. But Joyce, let me also say that these are very, very rare uh, occurrences. Uh, there are very, very few cases of Cana in, with, within our, our Canadian legal system of this, of this uh, state of automatism. In the day-to-day Drinking or getting high is not a defense to sexual assault, is not a defense to, to assault. Uh, violent crimes, if you are drunk and you commit a violent crime, you will be found guilty. That's not a defense. It was, it was not the case before the Supreme Court decision. It's not the case after. You, will, you are liable in those circumstances. But there still is, you know, you, you can still use extreme intoxication, if I'm understanding, as a defense. You said in extreme cases, so give me give me an example where, uh, because the, the the cases that were that were thrown out by the Supreme Court are are, are those were violent crimes. Uh, I mean, a man you know attacking a woman with a broomstick, uh, that sounds to me quite violent. Can so it still can be used? You said in extremely rare cases. Give me an example where it could be used, and where is the burden of proof then? Well, with respect to the example, the, the really the only case where, where this defense can be used is where one is in some way intoxicated or high on, on drugs to the point of being in, an, in an, uh, an automatism, a state of automatism. So you're no longer in control of your, of your movement. Um, and it's only in the case where you didn't reach that state uh, negligently. Uh, so if there was any reason why you should have known previous experience, why, why sh the risk should have been reasonably foreseeable that you would lose control of your, of your uh, actions, lose control of your capability to control yourself, if you want to put it that way, you will be found guilty in all of those cases. So, so we have covered with the law today most of the cases, um, the, most of the kinds of violent cases uh, that, that people were afraid uh, might be possible. We've only hived off one very, uh, very small exception, which is you, you had no reasonable means of knowing that you would, you would enter into that state. So the prescription drugs, for example, you're taking them for the first time, you have a reaction that leads you to a state of automatism. It is up to the person in the, in the, the proceeding to raise the defense and to, and to give evidence that they reached that state of automatism. On, and, then, and then it's obviously up to the Crown to dispute that. But it, the burden is initially on the person to raise that state of affairs, to, to give evidence of that state of affairs on, 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 a reasonable prob on, on the balance of probabilities. And then, and then, of course, the Crown can attack that. So again, it's, it, is a, it is a very uh, restricted defense. Uh, we think, though, that it, it meets the constitutional set standards set out by the court and maintains the accountability and the, and the confidence that people have in the, in the justice system in the sense that we know that virtually all cases of intoxication and extreme intoxication will lead to the person being charged with the violent act uh, that, that they committed. So basically somebody who takes a whole bunch of mushrooms and then commits, you know, horrific crimes will not be acquitted. In, in, it will depend on the circumstances, but in the vast majority of cases, we say yes, they will be found guilty. 
Okay. I want to ask you, Minister, because the House rises next week until September and the clock is ticking now. Will you be able to get this bill through before that? And are you working with the opposition? Confident, in, confident we will be able to get it through. I, I'm, I'm an optimist, but we have been working with the opposition. Uh, we have had conversations from, from the beginning. I have signaled that we would, we would find a, a path forward in the time that was remaining. Uh, and that there would be a there would be a proposed bill that we f we felt they could live with. We obviously didn't breach parliamentary so uh, parliamentary privilege, but um, we have had conversations. I'm pretty confident that this bill has the kind of consensus across Canadian society, victims groups, uh, women's groups, um, uh, legal experts, uh, and, and others. Uh, and there is a broad consensus across society. Uh, the opposition has expressed willingness to work with us. Uh, all of the parties in opposition have expressed willingness to work with us. So I'm pretty optimistic that both in the House and in the Senate, we can do what needs to be done with the time we have left. And you only have one week left. Uh, Minister Lametti, thanks so much for taking the time. And we wish you luck on this bill because we know uh, that it does take some time. But before I let you go, I want to ask you something. Uh, I want to talk about a charge connected to an assault at a residential school in Manitoba, a charge that, that has been laid against a 92-year-old priest after a 10-year investigation. Um, I'm wondering, is the federal government giving any First Nation support to undergo these kinds of very difficult investigations? Well, these kinds of investigations, as you know, Joyce, are, are undertaken by the police. And then charges uh, charges are laid in conjunction with uh, by the police, and then and then the, the cases proceed with uh, usually provincial prosecution services, but occasionally the federal the, the federal prosecution uh, service, and and they are independent of government. They are independent of me. Uh, but that being said, I think we all want to see serious crimes be punished seriously, particularly these because of the, the devastating impact that they have had. And no one should underestimate uh, our desire, or my desire as Minister of Justice, to see these kinds of uh, to see these kinds of crimes investigated and prosecuted, even if they took place a long time ago. And they are difficult indeed uh, to investigate and to prosecute. Justice Minister David Lametti, thanks for taking the time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.